Hello and welcome to Unleashed. I'm your host, Will Bachman, and I'm incredibly excited to be speaking today with the man who's behind uh, the Grand Central Partnership, 34th Street Partnership, and the Bryant Park Redevelopment, Dan Biederman, who also runs a consulting firm, uh, Biederman Redevelopment Ventures. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Will. So Dan, as a uh, adopted New Yorker who's been living in New York since uh, 2001, it's really a thrill to speak with you uh, behind some of the most important public spaces in New York. Um, could you just give us a, a bit? Uh, let's let's dive into the story of Bryant Park. Uh, what happened there, and uh, along the way, I hope to understand what is a business improvement district. But, but tell us a bit of the story of Bryant Park. Uh, Bryant Park in the early 80s was a disaster area, 500 felonies a year in the year before we started working on it in 1979, uh, well known as a place you didn't want to go. Um, and it was falling apart. Uh, there was graffiti. There were urine and feces everywhere, um, uh, drug markets at every entrance. So clearly something had to be done. The Rockefeller brothers decided to do something. They hired me to fix it. Uh, they had no particular ideas about how that got done. Uh, and I uh, came up with the scheme of having it uh, privately financed and privately managed. Um, uh, unique among 1900 parks in New York City. Some of them have private support, but none of them are completely privately managed and financed. Because so like, cause like took, what Central Park has the Central Park Conservancy, right? Well, correct. It's a very, very different business model. Okay. Uh, the city still pays for a quarter of the cost of Central Park. Uh, Central Park Conservancy, which has done a fabulous job, does uh, raises the money from philanthropy. Bryant Park, there's no philanthropy and no government money. Uh, we raise all our money from business arrangements with brands and surrounding property owners and uh, operators of our food concessions. Okay. And a lot of, you know, most listeners will be familiar, but just if you're not, um, you know, Bryant Park, it's kind of right behind the New York Public Library, right there between, sort of between Fifth Avenue and Sixth Avenue at what, 42nd and 42nd 40 Street. Street. Right in the Couldn't center be of the town. Yes, it, it couldn't be better positioned in the central business district. It's right in the center, the only public space really uh, uh, that's green and uh, is a public park right in the middle of the CBD. And, and hearing this history from you, it's, it's, it's hard for me to imagine because my whole time living in New York since, since 2001, it's always been this beautiful green space where there's um, you, know, mo you know movies outdoors in the summertime. In fact, my very first date with my wife was was uh, watching Casablanca at Bryant Park and then there's the the um, you know concerts and, and all and I, uh, ice skating right in the in the in the winter time yes so, and the merry-go-round so it's it's this incredible space now so tell us what wh how did tell us the story I'm sorry I interrupted you please keep going we um, started slowly. We started programming, as we call it, which is giving people reasons to be there to kind of push the drug sellers and the muggers out. And that was brave effort by the people who did it and by us because we had to supervise. Um, cleaning up uh, the litter, removing the graffiti, putting beautiful plants in, and then renovating the landscape um, uh, architecture. Um, and then gradually throughout the late 80s, early 90s, starting to raise enough money from business arrangements that there would be uh, adequate, adequate funds to, to maintain it that way. So um, the worst part about it was the um, uh, politics, which were very tough in New York even then, uh, would be worse now. I don't think the same thing could be done today. Um, and um, that's evidenced by how much grief I get from the lawyers that, who work for the city who say they'd never do another deal like this, and I think that's wrongheaded. Uh, so uh, it took um, almost a decade to get the business and legal arrangements put in place, and only a few years to get uh, the area turned around as far as crime and disorder. And Help, help us understand, where does the money come from? Like, why do, 
companies uh, contribute and, and who contributes to the, the funding of it? Uh, um, I should really describe this as pre and post COVID because COVID has uh, scrunched down our revenue budget. But prior to COVID coming in, we had a $21 million annual budget. Um, I'll describe where that comes from the winter activity, the ice rink and, and market that you mentioned, uh, uh, 10 or 11 million uh, in revenues from that, from ice skating rentals and great support from Bank of America, which is our name sponsor. They've been fabulous. And then um, several million, about three or four from concessions that operate in the park that sell food and drink. Mm -hmm. uh, Two and a half million dollars from the surrounding businesses, oh, the real estate owned by um, many companies, some national, some New York, um, and then a variety of other sources. Uh, we charge people to run commercial events there. We rarely do that. We sell material, um, uh, licensed uh, uh, equipment and the like, and uh, a few other miscellaneous sources. So total of $21 million. Uh, COVID the, is threatened. Of, yeah, so let's, yeah let's, let's focus pre-COVID for a while, just because that changes so many things. But um, yeah. In terms of the commercial events, I think Fashion Week takes place there. What 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 sort of other events do you have in the park? No, we had Fashion Week uh, from about 1993 to 2010. Okay. It got too big for the park, so we uh, offered it to Lincoln Center, which ran it for five years, and now they've spread out over town. So no more Fashion Week. It was good for the park. Um, uh, it was somewhat controversial because it took a lot of space. Um, eventually it just outgrew us. Um, and, um, uh, the events, uh, it's not an event park. We distinguish between, uh, parks with everyday amenities and, um, things that draw people all the time and ones that rarely do big events. Um, an example of that would be, uh, Centennial Olympic Park in Atlanta. It's really an event park. There's almost nobody there the rest of the time. And um, we uh, try not to be in an event park. So um, there, if you go into Bryant Park on an average day, you'll be able to do any of the following things. Um, this is in the summer, uh, spring, summer, fall. Um, uh, play ping pong, uh, participate in a reading room where there are books, and newspapers, and magazines uh, uh, for use, uh, all free, of course. Play board games. Um, practice on a putting green, play petanque, um, the European game you see in Paris and the south of France, um, uh, ping pong, uh, reading, uh, reading room events with authors and uh, screenwriting workshops and the like, yoga, uh, yoga classes, um, many uh, concessions. Uh, knitting, knitting lessons, language lessons. So the aim is that anytime you're there, you could find something to do that would further one of the interests you might have. Bird watching classes. I, I've only got about half half the way through all the things we have. So the 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 dollars that come from like local real estate owners, how did that work? Is that just purely voluntary? I mean, I can imagine they're rationale for contributing which is hey if the park is good uh and you know clean and free free of crime it's going to make our real estate more valuable uh but there's of course a free rider problem of you know let the other guy pay so how, how do you how does that work of collecting funds from local real estate owners that's where the national um uh vehicle called business improvement districts come in we were the first to uh, set up a large business improvement district for only the purpose of improving a park at Bryant Park. And the, the ones I did at Grand Central and 34th Street were later. Um, and business improvement districts collect money from property owners solely devoted to a, a stated purpose. You have to get political approval to do it. Um, uh, we uh, had to go out and convince all the surrounding property owners to support it because there's a lengthy public process to get one set. Um, so um, the surrounding owners have changed, but the biggest supporters of that $2.5 million now are Ivanhoe, Cambridge, and Hines, which own one of the biggest buildings, uh, Brookfield, which owns a couple of buildings, 
Durst, which owns the Bank of America building, and Bank of America itself is part owner of their building. Um, Tishman Spire, which owns 11 West 42nd, and TBC, which owns 452 Fifth. So there are several others, but those are the buildings that um, contribute on a roughly, I think we're talking currently about uh, 18 or 20 cents per square foot basis. And as you said, they're uh, added value for their buildings. Rents go up when there's something this pleasant next to them. And um, uh, they can collect those rents if they support the park generously. So how does that work? This uh, Explain to me a little bit more about a business improvement district. I've certainly heard of them before, but never really got the inside scoop of how they operate. And do, do you have to get all of the businesses to say yes, or is it like a majority and then they all have to contribute some tax to it? Just uh, walk me through what is a business improvement district. You set up a boundary, and within that boundary, every owner uh, must pay, and that uh, eliminates the free rider problem you mentioned. But to set one up, you don't have to get every single owner to approve it. It has to be a, a, a substantial majority, otherwise the government won't move it forward. The government then collects the money and redistributes it to um, an entity that's set up uh, to manage the funds and manage the programs. And in the case of Bryant Park, it's called the Bryant Park Management Corporation. At, uh, Grand Central is Grand Central Partnership, which I set up in 1985. And 34th Street Partnership near Penn Station set that up in 1989, and they both still exist. I don't run Grand Central anymore, but I run 34th Street and Bryant Park. So uh, they hire a staff and handle everything that would make uh, the neighborhood better. This is the pattern we set. We were really the first to do this on this major scale. So uh, security, sanitation, uh, a streetscape, which includes lighting and plantings and street signs and and the like, trash cans, um, much better uh, streetscape than you see in the rest of the city. Um, uh, social services, uh, in some cases, park operations, our 34th Street uh, project runs two small parks, Herald and Greeley Squares. So um, it really, um, in place of government in those neighborhoods or on top of government, hmm. you have uh, an entity that's going to make sure things are well run. What? Uh, how does the governance work for do the real estate owners who are kicking in the get to vote on a board of directors or does the city do that? How does the governance work? Um, the uh, directors um, are chosen, uh, approval by the city involved, but uh, basically the staff says, would you like to be on the board given you're contributing substantially to this? And then the board meets uh, periodically and um, uh, manages the staff. Uh, the board um, tends to be, in most piece of state legislation that govern this, a majority of property owners, some tenants, both uh, office and residential, and then some city officials. Okay. And I'm actually a little bit surprised at at how small how small a percentage of the budget is is actually contributions and that you know how much of it you're able to raise from you know, admission fees or other sorts of, of fees. Uh, and you know, how you've been able to, you know, largely kind of self-fund for the most part. Yeah. Um, it, it, not every district or park uh, improvement effort is set up this way. This, um, uh, I was started, uh, uh, the initial support came from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and the president of the fund, a brilliant guy named Bill Deedle, um, on my first day of work said, you know, the worst grantees we have are the ones that come back constantly for support. The best we have are the ones who get our initial support and then figure out a way to pay for their um, uh, efforts through other funds. So try to be like that. So I took that to heart. It fit my uh, background better. Um, so we don't, uh, we just decided not to do philanthropy, not to compete with social service programs and churches and, and dance groups and everybody else who does uh, charitable fundraising. Mm -hmm. And um, we're in the, it's, it's somewhat easier. We're in the middle of midtown Manhattan where people want to be visible, but 
this technique has worked all over the country where we've uh, advised clients how how to uh, how to do it. Now, you mentioned that the attorneys from the city said they'd never do a similar deal. Ta- tell us about some of the particularities of the deal that you have with the city and and what are the things that they wouldn't do today? Uh, there's a set of papers that have gotten progressively weaker, but we still cope with it because just by virtue of the th- of the project having worked out well, nobody really bothers us. But there, initially, there was a set of papers. There's a lease on a portion of the park and a um, uh, management agreement on a portion of the park, which has now become a license. Um, and those papers require us to do certain things in order to keep control, remove litter, remove snow and ice, uh, maintain the capital plant. Um, And um, the environment uh, for such deals, as I mentioned, was hostile in the 80s when we did it. There were a lot of people opposed, preservation groups, parks groups. Once they saw that it was good, they changed their minds and many of them became supporters. But the uh, as one of my attorney's jokes, um, the only people in New York who don't like the Brian Park arrangement are a few lawyers in the corporation counsel's office. And, uh, uh, you know, it's just a matter of uh, sticking with the old way of doing things, I guess you could say. Hmm. Okay. Um, can you give us a little bit of a play-by-play of some of the steps that it took to get these agreements in place? I mean, this sounds almost like it could be a you know, a sequel to the the power broker, you know, by by Robert Caro, you know, d- detailing some of the the um, lo- alignment building that it was required to get different uh, groups on board. Can you tell us some of the stories from that time? Yeah, my my chairman um, for Bryant Park, Andrew High School, who was the chairman of Time Inc. when we started, uh, very famous and prestigious guy in New York uh, uh, when he would talk about his frustration about how long it was taking I would say uh, everybody in the Western Hemisphere and his brother has reviewed these plans and (laughs) uh, he was a journalist so he spoke that way and um, uh, there were meetings with the community board which um, coincidentally I happened I, I had been the chairman of that's a local, in effect, zoning review group that it's given control over such uh, changes in Midtown Manhattan. Um, uh, as, as Andrew and some other board members said, we have to hang out in church basements and get the approval of these community groups. Um, there were um, interesting meetings with um, people who would contribute in the short run to the improvements of um, uh, Brian Park that were necessary. There was a, f- a famous woman, Enid, Enid Haupt, who was a huge backer of the New York Botanical Garden. And when we went to her for garden funding, she decided she didn't like our garden consultant. So she said, I'll give you money for lighting instead, which was three times as much. <laughs> so there were a lot of a lot of twists and turns um, on such things. Um, uh, I still, uh, most of the controversy happened in the mid eighties and I still, uh, have grudges about who didn't back me and who did back me from then. Um, but, uh, it was, uh, a very difficult political process. And the sad thing is the park could have been in place much earlier than it was as a result of how lengthy the political process was. And what types of stakeholders were, opposed to the park and and what were their their rationale for for opposing the idea um one of the bad things about it is somebody said to me a wise thing in the middle of this process you know a lot of those people who are opposing your plans for bryant park haven't set foot there in two decades but the um the most of the opposition came from the preservation community uh, and a little bit from kind of university professors and the like who said, oh, this is a very dangerous precedent. Um, there will be um, um, a tendency to favor rich people and the like, and um, uh, that's the opposite that's happened. The people who need public spaces like this are um, – 
uh, not wealthy. The average income we believe in Bryant Park is about $55,000 a year. Um, so they don't have private clubs to go to generally or huge backyards at their houses or, um, you know, fancy restaurants. Um, and Bryant Park is their, is their home. But it was, it was, uh, there was more opposition from the left than from the right. Um, and, uh, uh, it's, it's mostly taken care of in the eighties as time went along. Some of the groups that had opposed us, some of the parks groups particularly became allies and said, this is really good. These guys are paying attention to, um, uh, horticulture and all the things we thought they wouldn't care about. And it, it has become a very democratic with a small D space. Uh, a lot of people use it and it's very diverse and massively, uh, occupied. It's uh, the most busy per acre park in the world, it's about 700 people per acre, which is way more than anything else that's kind of famous for busyness. The Tuileries, uh, Trafalgar Square, you know, we, they're nowhere near us in terms of crowding l- large groups in. And what were the preservationists concerned about? We were going to build some kiosks and a restaurant because there were certain places in the park that just could not be uh, improved without some activity that was year-round. And the restaurant in front of the back wall of the New York Public Library was something we had to fight for for three or four years. We really thought it was necessary to have some winter activity and some revenue. And there were some preservationists who were dead set against that. I see. How did you, like, what did it take to finally get either people on board or to get sufficient approval that you were able to move forward? Just persistence and, uh, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say public relations wise, we didn't really control the environment. We just had to patiently go to public meetings and make our case and hope that in the end it would be approved. A, a very smart zoning um, specialist, Steve Lefkowitz. Uh, advised us, and he had an interesting chart. He would draw what they call a two-by-two in the investment banking world and private equity world where um, you have four quadrants. And he said the world's divided into projects that are um, good ideas and bad ideas and then supported by powerful people or powerless people. So he said the projects backed by powerless people that are bad ideas in the first place almost never happen. <laughs> and at the opposite, he said the ones that are bad ideas backed by powerful people happen about a quarter of the time, despite themselves. And good ideas backed by people who don't have a lot of power only happen about that often. But the projects backed by that are good ideas, and he said making Bryant Park a accessible to the public and pleasant and um, full of activity and safe is a great idea. And he said, you have the Rockefellers behind you and the property owners, the near public library. So, and Ed Koch, the mayor at the time. So powerful people want it to happen. So it's going to happen. So stop worrying. But I did worry every day. <laughs> I mean, this, that same, uh, two by two, which I love, uh, probably applies to projects within corporations as well. That, uh, that's right. I, every time I describe it to somebody, they say, Hey, that's smart. I'm going to use that. Yeah. There, there was a deputy mayor under, um, uh, Bloomberg, who said, I've never heard that, but that's really right. So, um, I'm, I'm afraid, uh, though, that the, tw- that the 25% is probably a little bit too low, that if it's a bad idea <laughs> by a powerful person, it's uh, it might be more than 25%. Um, well, I tried to fit it into my scheme. <laughs> Westway, I thought, was a bad idea. Powerful people were behind it. It didn't happen. And the 42nd Street trolley, was a great idea, but powerful people weren't behind it, so it didn't happen. So I think generally Lefkowitz was right. Tell us a little bit about the 34th Street Partnership, a different and uh, different type of arrangement. Is that one also a business develop improvement district? And and just tell us uh, what that one's all about. Yeah, that 34th Street's principally funded by the business improvement district. The assessment there is higher; it's about 35 cents a foot, and. Um, we, on the first day of our work there, we removed all the graffiti that accumulated over a couple of decades, um, started sweeping litter. It had been ankle-deep litter by the end of the day. The city just did not do a good job 
picking up litter on the sidewalks and curbs. We put a force out there to do it. And um, and I think you can uh, still see and, these folks. And I've always wondered about this, which is those are the folks wandering around and they have the kind of the vest on that says, I think, 34th Street, you know, Improvement District on it. Yes. I always wondered, like, you know, what is this? So now now I know. All right. Uh, those are the those those are the equivalent of what were called the white wings way back. Nobody remembers this. You'd have to be about eighty. But uh, the city had white clad workers who picked up litter until the sixties or so, and they went out of that business. And as a result, the streets were filthy for a couple of decades. And we put that back in, and we pay for it. And it's led to thousands of um, employed people because a lot of districts emulated us. Great. Okay, so you have folks picking up litter, clean graffiti. What are the part? What are what's the other aspects of the business improvement district for Thirty Fourth Street? Well, we took over Harold and Greeley Square Parks and run them very much like we run Bryant Park. We replaced the very unattractive streetscape, and those are the things that I mentioned: the lampposts, um, uh, the trash cans, street signs. These are all appointments the way we've done them you wouldn't see anywhere else in the city we paid for that uh using some uh, debt that we undertook um and um it's about 25 million dollars of improvements over the first few years and uh that's a major function we maintain all that stuff we don't ask the city to maintain it and then we have security force um, which is an unarmed force reporting in effect to the nypd and uh, they intervene in crimes and um, uh, have, crime came down massively between our first days and five or 10 years in, we reduced crime with the city having done a very good job at that time under Bill Bratton principally. Uh, we reduced crime by 90, 95%. And it's creeping up now given all the disarray that the newspapers and others have covered but it's um, still nowhere near what it was. Yeah, speaking of uh, Horace and Greeley Square, I, I like the empanada place that you have there. I, I always <laughs> yes. enjoy that. Um, are, so you mentioned taking on debt. So tell us a little bit more about business improvement districts. Do they kind of last forever? Do they have a certain charter they can take on debt, I assume, based on future uh, expected um, you know, payments by the local... Just what is it like a it's not, it's not like a company is it a, like an actual private company or is it more of an authority like the triborough bridge authority what what is, what are these things they're nonprofits uh, organized under uh new york state law to represent the property owners and um as such they have the ability to incur debt because and and the ability to repay it because they are uh, the, the debt payments are backed by the value of the office buildings. So not many, I, almost nobody in the country has emulated me in doing that. I thought they would. Um, but uh, we stepped in where the city wasn't with regard to um, capital improvements. And um, the districts generally continue on. A c- couple of them have been terminated nationally, but Generally, they if they're created in the first place, they're filling a role that was very much necessary in the minds of the property owners. Do you typically see some resistance from like the parks department of a city because, to some degree, they're giving up power, they're giving up control over you know some prime parks in their network. So, how do you navigate that? Depends on the. Um, uh, the particular city that's involved um, and who the commissioner is. We had, most of the commissioners have been supportive of us. There are such plans that can be killed uh, uh, by kind of lukewarm attitudes by the mayors involved. I would, you know, we've worked in so many cities just off the top of my head. Portland was <clears throat> very able guy, but he, I think he really wanted to run it in house and he smoothly, took on a project we were running in the neighborhood near Lloyd Center and turned it into something they would run, and it didn't turn out all that well, uh, despite good intentions. Um, And uh, a few other cases, there have been parks commissioners uh, who didn't want it to happen. I have my eye on something now for a client I won't disclose 
in San Francisco where the parks commissioner is terrific and he would uh, already has told us he would cooperate in private management and funding of a space that's technically under his control right now. Hmm. I mean, these are to some degree, so thanks for explaining that they're nonprofits. To some degree, it's almost as if we are taking a little part of a city and kind of adding on a layer of self-government to it um, and with kind of taxing ability and the ability to provide services like, as an additional layer to a normal city government. I, it's, it's kind of fascinating. I never knew this was going on. Yeah, that's a fair description. So let's talk a little bit about some of your work uh, outside of New York City. So your your firm has done consulting on projects across the U.S. and around the world. Tell us about uh, kind of how you've grown and the type of projects that you that you support. Generally, they involve public space in some way or other, sometimes public parks, sometimes downtown plazas that are more gray than green, sometimes um, privately owned spaces that the public can use, uh, like a plaza that's been required uh, as part of a uh, entitlements process for a real estate development. So um, a pretty well-known space is um, you know, the Clyde Warren Park in Dallas, which is over a highway, uh, didn't exist before. It was probably the best park in the Southwest. It gets mentioned more often than Riverwalk in San Antonio now in Texas, which is a big, big achievement because that's a great project. Um, and um, Salesforce Park is an interesting one on top of a transit center in San Francisco. Nobody ever anticipated a bus terminal would have a park on top. We we manage the programming there and several other aspects, including the horticulture um, and um, some more conventional pu- public park spaces. One in Houston, Levy Park, um, used to be lackluster and kind of dull. And one in Greensboro, um, uh, LeBauer Park, um, which was a parking lot before. Pittsburgh, same thing, parking lot into park. It's right in front of the University of Pittsburgh and called Shenley Plaza. So we've um, been in different regions. It's been very interesting to work with different governments. We're working on a tiny one now in Nashville called Church Street Park that um, uh, has been dominated by people sleeping there and uh, committing crimes there, and they would like that to change. And typically, who is engaging your firm's services? I would say over time, this depends on how the economy is doing, but over time, mainly real estate developers, some downtown organizations, um, foundations and the like, that was the case in uh, Greensboro, Um, sometimes government, and this interesting sideline we have in professional sports, um, um, professional sports franchises that have arenas or stadia that are not in uh, full use all the time, obviously. So the public spaces, they would like to be lively rather than dead. and They'd like to be a good factor in the community. So we started with the New York Jets and then uh, worked with the Packers in Green Bay, <clears throat> which was a challenge just because it's such a small town. And then um, <clears throat> in Atlanta, the Falcons, and a big project in San Francisco with the Giants adjacent to their stadium. So you're make, trying to make use of the areas right around the stadiums or you know, make it so people can go in the stadiums? Or what, what sorts of things are you doing in, in and around the stadiums? Varies. Green Bay and Atlanta, it's the areas right next to the football stadiums. Uh, the Giants, it's a separate area they're turning into a real estate development with very nice residential and office buildings. Um, and, uh, the, um, we're doing an interesting project with a professional sports team now that has nothing to do with their arena. The Detroit Pistons hired us to help neighborhood parks. They had moved from the suburbs to downtown Detroit, but felt they wanted to be received as a great, um, supporter of neighborhood parks that were forgotten. So we've been programming all summer in the face of COVID, which was very difficult, um, a lot of these neighborhood parks, five of them, uh, specified by Mayor Duggan, and it's been a great project with tons of challenges because of COVID. What have you learned that 
has been surprising or counterintuitive about what will actually draw people to parks. I imagine that there's been things that you tried that you were excited about that turned out to be kind of duds, and then things that maybe you tested and surprised you how popular they were. So if you read The Power Broker, Robert Moses had these very strong prejudices about what people should be doing outside, you know, exercise and swimming in the ocean and 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 you know, open spaces um and so he and he was not a, you know, typically very open to you know kind of community input um i'm interested in what you've tried and learned and what's been surprising to you as you've uh, worked on programming for these different places well several interesting things one is um uh, first of all, the measure of success, obviously, is the number of people in your space, but also the number of women as opposed to men. The, the higher percentage you have of females, the better your park is. They have much better sense of uh, what's unsafe and what's safe. So if you, Bryant Park used to be 90% male when it was dangerous, and it's now about 60% female. So women vote with their feet. They're very alert to threats to their security. So when you count, uh, you have to count that way. That's one of the inter interesting things we learned from one of my mentors, William H. White Jr., who always said, just when you go into space, you're supposed to improve. Do female and male counts, and you'll learn a lot. Um, an interesting thing about programming, the question you ask, is sometimes you think you're going down. The crowds will be extremely small at the beginning. And there's this odd phenomenon where um, after two or three years, you're still getting small crowds and you say, is it really worth it to have this uh, event where only seven or 11 people are coming in? But um, then sometimes after year three, it goes crazy. So that was, that's was that been true in Brian on a few programs that which are ones? very large now. Which, which ones became uh, popular after a few years? Um the reading room had very few visitors early on, and then it became very popular. The counts uh, for the events, too. Um, yoga didn't exactly have that profile. It started with very small numbers, I think 35. So it's free yoga uh, classes twice a week. Um, we didn't do them this year because of COVID, but we will next year. And uh, that is now, before COVID, that was about 1,300 at peak. What? So it's the biggest, <laughs> yeah, the biggest yoga class. <laughs> I was in I was in Ottawa um, one day, and they had yoga in front of the capital of of Canada, and I was uh, I was watching, and I said I really wish that I had some assistance here because I'd like to count to see if they're as big as we are. I don't think they are, but it's quite busy. You have people all over downtown Ottawa with yoga mats going to the front of the capital, uh, but. Um, uh, others, it's it's more steady. We've had a few that we just decided weren't worth it. I'm trying to think of them. Not many. Um, uh, but um, And games, that's another one. That's been patiently building. We have 45 or so games, other than chess and uh, backgammon, which are always in Bryant Park. These are board games like Monopoly and Risk and uh, Settlers of Catan and uh, Parcheesi and Chinese chess, and they, uh, we have an attendant who encourages people to play and gives them the boards, and it's all complicated now. We have to wipe them due to COVID and the like, but next year, I think it'll be back to normal. And, and, you, that, and you, so that's you can had a steady and slow increase. That's in cool. Visitation. Anything that you can recall trying that, that actually didn't, didn't work and you ended up cutting it? Yeah, I'm trying to remember if there's a particular program that uh, we don't do anymore. Most of them, just by strength of effort, we did get to work. Um, uh, let me think. There's one that's um, we thought we were going to terminate. I, I was in um, uh, Malmo, Sweden with my family, and I saw a game being played on a lawn by some Swedes, which turned out to be Cube, K-U-B-B, -B, which is a Viking chess, as they call it in Scandinavia, that um, took forever to catch on. But I think it eventually did. And we're not running it this year because of COVID, but I, um, it's got its own little devoted group of people. So <laughs> almost everything has eventually taken off. I got to play me some, some Viking chess. That sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> um, 
so getting back to your consulting firm, when you uh, get pu pulled in by whether it's the, the developer or the um, local government, do you then, you know, as consultants, help set up a business improvement district? Is that often the kind of the end product that you're trying to get to? So it's self-sustaining. No, uh, generally not. Um, uh, sometimes we're fixing a public space that's already within one. Other times it's just not appropriate for the financial setup. But currently um, we're negotiating with a neighborhood in Nashville uh, where we would um, set up a, a business improvement district. It's a hot neighborhood not far from downtown. And um, uh, there are some public spaces that would benefit from that. But generally it's a more diversified group of revenue sources. Uh, we pride ourselves on that. We tell the clients, you need seven sources. Two or three of them are not going to work out and not raise much money. So you've got to work on the other four and then come up with some other ideas. Uh, so Bryant Park has, as I said, revenue from about five different directions coming in. And um, we always felt in the case of a recession we would be able to substitute one for the other. COVID has been so devastating to groups in New York and elsewhere that we've had to really be inventive how to uh, keep the Bryant Park programming and operations going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of the decades being involved with Bryant Park and other um, landmark um, improvement districts, in New York City and elsewhere, I imagine there's been a lot of satisfaction. So is there any kind of story that comes to mind of something that, that um, was particularly important to you, something someone said to you or, a, a, you know, an anecdote or something that you witnessed that, that made you just really proud of your life's work? Huh. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to quote, uh, I, the nicest comments are the ones you get from your adversaries. <laughs> um, because <laughs> you, uh, people who like you, you know, already are going to say nice things, but occasionally I won't name them, but occasionally somebody who's been an enemy makes a concession. And I, those are the ones I, and I'm, I'm, I'm nice about it. And, and, um, uh, there've been a few of those. And then of course you talk to your family all the time, more candidly, my wife had this, um, and she's been with me from the beginning. I met her just before I started Bryant Park. She's a fine arts lawyer. And um, uh, but has become expert in our field and actually handles the legal work now for uh, BRV. And she said in about when I was despairing of getting the company up and running, she said, you know, this was the early O's. She said, if, if you just stopped and retired now, just the turnaround of Bryant Park, forgetting all the BIDs and the stuff in other cities, that's enough. You can just be proud of your career. So that's nice. I didn't agree with her, but that's <laughs> That was a nice comment from a close-in source who actually can be a very uh, tough critic when she sees something she doesn't like and what we've done. She actually led to one of the great improvements in the winter, which is the Winter Village, when she kind of suggested how we might run it so it was more attractive to uh, people approaching the, the winter activities. Yeah, the Winter Village is awesome. Uh, Dan, you mentioned BRV. Where can people find your firm online if they want to learn more? Uh, we have a great website, uh, BRV Corp. B as in boy, R as in radio, V as in Victor, corp.com. And all the projects we've done are described in there. And there's some mention of Bryant Park and 34th Street in New York and Grand Central. But um, it's interesting. A lot of people have told me it's fun to go through it because whatever city they're going to, it kind of guides them as to what might be fun to visit while they're taking time off from work. That sounds like a fantastic idea. Next time you're traveling, check out the work of BRV, see how they've touched the city that you're going to, and learn a little of the background behind some of the public spaces that you're visiting. Dan, this was such a pleasure and privilege to speak with you. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much, Will. Thanks for your good questions.